Welcome to Prop Hour on Soil Health. Today, Christopher Graham is going to be speaking on integrated livestock, integrating livestock into cropping systems and discuss cover, grazing cover crops. And Chris Graham is an associate professor slash extension agronomist, and he is stationed at the West you are at the West River Agriculture and Research Farm, correct? Yep. And you're the manager of that too. Correct. We'll get started then. <clears throat> yeah, so as, as Hans mentioned, um, one of my primary roles at SDSU is uh, managing the, the West River Research Farm, which is east of Sturgis. And so um that's about a, it's a 110 acre farm and uh, we we do a number of different research i don't know focal areas or focal points i think we do we probably we grow roughly 10 to 15 different crops every year um and my background is in soil biology and soil chemistry so we focus a lot about a lot on what these these systems are doing to the to the soil. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about another objective that we we try to, to push pretty hard is, is how can we get livestock integrated back into some of our small grain systems? And so um, I'll be discussing, you know, as, as the title says, the short-term benefits to annual grains through integrated livestock. And so, you know, the, the idea, here is where can we find these st strategic time points within our cropping rotations, our, our grain-based rotations, um, where livestock cattle in this case um, can can serve a niche role. And, and so um, we're looking at a number of different things in the soil as far as parameters, carbon sequestration, building carbon, um, but also on a fertility side, you know, can we use livestock to not necessarily replace fertilizer, but can we use livestock to achieve some sort of offset? So we reduce some of our dependence on these on external uh, fertilizer applications. And so before I just dive into the work, I wanted to give a little bit of of background and kind of what what where our thinking comes from on a lot of this and and much of this is just you know, it comes from this this notion that you know the farm landscape has changed dramatically over the last 150 years or so um and in particular over this last you know since roughly the 1950s and i think that's nothing new but when you start to dive into some of the the numbers um, it's really striking. And so I have a couple different graphs I wanted to show. The first, um, so there are two sort of mirror images going on in this, this figure. Um, and you can see on the, the x-axis there, it's a time frame from 1900 to 2012. And that top line with the short dashed, the, the, the short dashes, uh, corresponds to the primary y-axis. So that's the number of farms. And as you can see, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, we averaged somewhere between six and seven million farms. Um, and then mid-century, starting in the 40s and 50s, we saw this precipitous dive um, where far the number of farms across this, the country was, was roughly a third of what it had been. And then it's kind of stabilized since the mid nineties or so. Um, and then you look at the second one. So the, the longer dashed line corresponds to the second uh, Y axis. And so this is the acres per farm. And as you can see, you know, that mirror, that reverse trend where um, back in the 1900s, obviously there was uh, a lot of limitations in terms of the land that you could cover. Um, but as farms got as farm numbers decreased, the average size uh, increased. So you can see it jumps up. And now you see this kind of, you know, roughly four or five hundred acres per farm. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why these things happen. It's there's no one reason. Um, 
one major reason though i think is is mechanization you know on a good day farmers they're ready to go they can cover several hundred acres in a day even you know and so um just those some of those those logistics have been cleared just by mechanization there's many other things with economics that i'm not going to get into so you saw that average though you know maybe 400 acres is an average but that is just an average and there's a lot of nuance within that and so one of the interesting things that this graph shows so this goes just from 1987 to 2017 so this 30 year period and these different colors in here represent the size of uh, the farm. So these are different bins for, for numbers. So blue less than hundred going up to this green, which is greater than 2000 acres for the, for a farm. And the big, the, the striking trend here is that really what uh, the, these farms that are 2000 acres are in grit and larger has increased quite a bit, you know, uh, note there farms that are 2000 acres increased from 13% in the mid 80s to over 40% in 2017. And so you can see there's this kind of gradual consolidation of farmland. On the other side, if you look at permanent pasture and rangeland, it's kind of a different trend. So these are the, the numbers are kind of uh, the, the colors are, are similar to the previous graph. However, the ranges are much different. And you, what you can actually see, so this is permanent rangeland from you know zero to 100%. And going back to 87, you can see there's a slight contraction in the amount of acres that were in permanent pasture. And so why might that be? Um, you know, again, no single answer. There's lots of reasons why, but some of it is that, you know, we need less land to grow cows in, in many cases. They're more efficient than they were. Um, we're much more, uh, you know, feedlots have become the norm, you know, they, uh, as opposed to the turn of the 20th century where they didn't exist. Uh, starting in the 60s, you know, the feedlot became a much bigger issue. And so cows are on the grass a lot um, for a lot shorter period of time. And they're just more efficient when they're there. And so, um, it, again, you know, this is setting aside all these economic contractions and things that have, especially like in the 80s, for example, um, but the, the, the take home here is that farmland has been e increasing, pasture, rangeland is kind of steady, uh, but maybe decreasing some of these really large farms. And here's the thing that I think it really interests me is that um, we're also becoming much more, the agricultural community is becoming much more uh, specialized. And so what this graph shows, again, going from 1900 to 2012, this is products per farm. And so the dark line is commodities only, and the, the, the lighter gray line is specialty plus commodity. And what it's showing basically is, you know, again, turning to the tw early 20th century, you see the average farm had five commodities. And now this might be, this might be grains, but it, it might also be animals and likely it is animals and grains both. Um, so they might be growing five different commodities and then maybe another specialty crop. So some sort of vegetable or, or multiple vegetables you can see. And then again, it starts to, to fall off um, and then precipitously after the 60s until now, uh, the average farm is growing really only one product per farm, which seems, which seems crazy. Um, but this increased specialization means that there's increased silos. Um, and it's hard to find numbers, but I have this last bullet point here between 96 and 2015. Farms producing crops and livestock fell from 33% to 22%. And so even that number, though, 33% in 1996, there was already quite a. Um, there, there was also this this great separation, you know, that occurred throughout the 1900s where we increasingly became farmers only and ranchers only, and, and we didn't cross that anymore. And one of the things that I think we lost in that transition, um, you know, and don't get me wrong, that there's been many great efficiencies in doing that. We produce more food than we ever have, obviously, and we're more efficient than we've been. Um, 
but one of the things that I, I think about is what we what have we lost when we started to um, segregate these two systems? And I think about the fertility side. And so, um, you know, the, the use of, of manure goes back 8,000 years. If you think about, well, we, we first started seeing some evidence of crop domestication of, of some of the ancient wheats, einkorn emmer, some of those those wheats maybe 12,000 years ago. But really widespread agriculture um, was really, it's only about 8,000 years as a, as a, as a um, deliberate practice, a practice where much of the, the, the population was dedicated to that was roughly 8,000 years ago. And there's some really cool research as archeobiologists that looked at stable isotopes and they could see that um, fertilizer from manure as a manure as fertilizer is basically as old as that. And so agriculture itself has always evolved with livestock in that system. And so it's kind of funny that we're researching this, um, you know, because it's obviously it's not new. Um, but the concept is, has been, um, it's been lost in some cases. And so, um, you know, as a result, our use of fertilizer has increased, increased quite dramatically. Um, you know, when after World War II or so, well, if I back up, so the Haber-Bosch process allowed us to, that, that invention allowed us to make uh, fertilizer from the atmosphere where it wasn't ever possible before. And so after World War II, as, you know, munitions were not being used, um, we started to have all this leftover nitrate and the fertilizer, which was the obvious, um, the obvious uh, use of that extra stuff was let's go dump it in on the fertilizer. Um, and so that was the case. And this graph here kind of highlights that, you know, from about 1960 to 2020, this is the nitrogen fertilizer use in pounds per acre across the US. And so it's quite a dramatic increase. Um, and you can see that nitrogen fertilizer prior to 1960 was almost nil. Um, and then obviously now it's it's quite extensive. And so uh, one of the things that we're quite interested in is what if we, as I said, is if we bring the cows back, what is that offset that we can find? And so this is a really uh, big graph or lots of graphs, actually. It's a, it's a meta-analysis. Um, done in Europe where they were looking at all these different studies. So each, each graph represents different crops. Um, but all these different studies where they looked at increasing fertilizer rates. So you can see on the x-axis, you have increasing fertilizer for each of those. And then on the y-axis, you have yield. And so this blue line represents the uh, fertilizer only. So let's say it's urea or whatever, uh, UAN or something else. Um, and then the red line represents a mix of farmyard manure plus the fertilizer. Um, so it's basically offsetting or using the same amount of, of, of nitrogen, but in the red line would be some fertilizer, some, some manure, whereas the blue line is fertilizer only. And basically what you see is the red line always outperforms the blue line uh, especially at lower nitrogen rates. The ones I've highlighted are all uh, wheat. So what we're showing or what they were showing here is at lower nitrogen rates, you get this sort of synchrony between um, with the, the fertilizer and the manure where you're getting some, something is happening there. There's this synergy and you're outperforming uh, with the fertilizer alone. And so that was really one of our big motivations for the study that, that I'm going to present. Um, and the second is that, you know, what you can see, uh, we, we see a lot of stuff with uh, where we are inter inter integrating livestock, for example, in these AMP systems, um, you know, where it's multi-paddock systems where you're grazing pretty heavily. Um, you tend to see these long-term benefits, and that's when, we're, especially when we're looking at carbon, these things take time. And so we kind of had this idea, uh, thought like, well, okay, so is there any, what are the benefits 
to the short in the short term in the near term for producers is there a value to bringing those cows in right now something that they can kind of you can hold on to that's tangible as you're trying to build these longer term effects and so the idea here is we were looking at a full season cover crop bringing in livestock and then producing uh, and then growing wheat afterwards and so the the idea is that we have a small grain system this is a wheat based system and we also as it turns out our research farm is east of sturgis um, we also have a research herd uh, livestock or cattle that spends their summers uh, near us about five miles. And so, you know, we're in the Western part of the state, a lot of short grass, cool season um, range. And so that forage starts to shut off in July, April, or excuse me, August. And so the system that we were kind of mimicking here was, could we grow a, a full season cover crop uh, and then as those cows are coming off of their summer pastures, they could swing by, graze our cover crops really heavily, um, and then go off to wherever they go for the rest of the winter. So it's kind of that stockpiling uh, forage idea. And so we also wanted to look at a couple different grazing uh, systems as well. So the idea was we grow, we grow a cover crop, uh, which I'll explain on the next slide. The other treatment was we have these controls. So we have a sorghum sedan grass control, which is just hay. Grow the sorghum sedan grass, hay it, bale it, remove it. That's it. And then um, we'll grow wheat over it the next year. The two grazing scenarios that we were looking at was grow a cover crop, swath graze it, and then graze the swaths, or just graze the standing cover crop. So those are two different treatments. And then a fourth control that we, or excuse me, a fourth treatment, second control was uh, just grow the cover crop, don't graze it, let it die, and then plant wheat into it. So as you can see, our study indicators are what happens to the spring wheat when you plant it over all these different systems uh, in the following year. Um, we are not going to fertilize it, so we're going to just see what is the what is the effect of the cows on yield and fertility without any fertility, any applied fertility, and then are there any short term health effects? And so, I always uh, struggle explaining that design, so I'm going to beat it really to death here. So, here's the, here's what it looked like in the field. So we would have um, those four different treatments laid out. Uh, and these are three acre blocks that they're grazing. And so again, we have a sorghum sedan control. No cows see these, these plots here, here, here. They're replicated down the field. Uh, we have the swath graze. We have the graze standing cover crop. And then we have the ungrazed cover crop. So those are the four cover crop like treatments. Then the following year, so after it's been grazed or hayed or just left to die, we're gonna plant spring wheat in it. At the same time, we're gonna move down to the next plot side and reestablish year two of this, this thing. So all we're looking at is one year effects. So graze, graze one year, grow wheat the next year. That's, that's it. We're not looking at subsequent years beyond that necessarily for this study. We really just wanted to focus on the short term. So that second year turns to the third year, that goes to spring wheat, we plan our next set, and then that goes to spring wheat in year four. So by the end of this study, we have three years of, of cover crop grazing, and we have three years of spring wheat growth followed, following the cover crop grazing. So I want to be clear how we're, we're looking at this. These are not the same fields. They're, we keep moving farther down the field every time we establish a new, a new set. So... Let's first look at the covered crop biomass. So first of all, what was the cover crop species that we planted? As you can see here, this is the whole mix. Um, by and large, it's oats, peas, and, and sorghum sedan. Uh, there's a few other things, but these, you know, in the percentages that they're available or they were planted in, they're not really, uh, they're hard to find even. And so I guess I'm a believer of fairly, um, 
simple mixes and we were looking for biomass production and so we wanted it to be uh, quite a grass heavy mix and then the choice of oats and sorghum sedan was basically we were planting in late june with the idea that we're going to graze it in early september and so uh, we wanted kind of a mix of warm season and cool season grasses to to hopefully complement each other. And it's kind of funny how this turned out um, because you can see where the cool season and where the warm season grasses really excelled. Um, so this shows our cover crop growth. And again, that's, uh, you know, like July, August, September. So there's maybe three months of growth um, in there, depending on the year. And we have 2021 here. 20, or excuse me, 2020, 2021, and 2022. You have the cover crop and the sorghum sedan are the two comparisons. Again, that sorghum sedan was the control. So yield is on the y-axis. 2020, um, you can see the cover crop really did better. And that's that's more or less, that's basically the oat production there in there um, did quite well. So we had a, a better, uh, season later in the growing season for the, the, the oats. Um, 2021, miserable uh, all around pretty much. And then you have this flip. So the sorghum sedan actually outperformed the cover crop. But, you know, at the end of the day, we were getting about a ton of biomass. And that's really how we kind of calibrated our stocking rates is they were based on moving through an acre in about... Um, or excuse me, moving through a three acre plot about an acre a day. And so we kind of wanted to, as I said, I, I'm not going to get into the animal numbers as much, but the herd size was more or less determined by the amount of biomass that we had and the idea that we wanted to be moving them pretty pretty quickly, about every ever, every day or so uh, to get a new set of uh, new fr fresh grass area. Um, and so obviously that's much easier uh, if we can just, we pen them in, I think I can go back here and show really quickly. Um, this picture kind of shows what that looks like in practice where these, these cows are grazing um, in, in the late fall, they're grazing one of the swath plots and they're moving down, um, down the field kind of same, or as, as we allow them to, to progress. So going back here. All right, so this one, um, this is really the, the take home message here. And then we're gonna talk about why this might or might not have happened. Um, but this is the yield following the, the grazing treatments in spring wheat. So this is uh, an aggregation of all three years of data. Um, and you can see on the y or x axis, we have swath graze and cover crop graze, the first two. Our control, which was the sorghum sedan hay, and then our cover crop control. Y axis is our yield here. And I use these box plots a lot because I really like that they can, they, they show a lot of data um, in a very compact image here. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. So basically what these show uh, these sometimes they're called box and whisker plots. Um, the box itself shows the 75th and 25th percentile. This dark line is the, the median, and this little triangle here is the mean. Um, and then each one of the little points within this is a measured value. So we take lots of replications for our yields. Um, sometimes we have like eight or nine uh, reps per year. So there's a lot of measurements. And what you can see there is, again, this is over three years. You can see there's a lot of spread though, like in 2021, very dry. You know, we were low, quite low um, in, the, in the 20s and 30s uh, for yield. And then the other years we had better yield. So we were in 50s and 60s. So when you average this all together though, we, you know, we had about maybe 40, 43, 40, 42, bushel average in the swath graze and the cover crop graze was more or less the same. Statistically, these are the same, maybe slightly less. But the interesting thing and the kind of the neat thing that we found is that the, the control and the cover crop control were about the same 
and they were about 37, uh, 37 bushels. So across the, the full three years, um, we found that where we were grazing livestock prior to the, the, the uh, spring wheat, we gained about four bushels or so, five bushels maybe. In some years, it was quite a bit more. In some years, it was much, much less. Um, and again, that that the thing that I noted was there is no fertility with this. So um, then the idea is, okay, so we're getting these this yield increase from in our wheat from these grazing these livestock. What is it? What's causing that? Um, and so I'm going to go through a whole series of different graphs here quickly um, and show a lot of different stuff. So we start, show, you know, it's a process of elimination, I guess. And so first thing we think of, you know, we're averaging 16 inches of rain a year. So the first thing on the, you know, at the forefront is always, well, is it a soil moisture difference? And so this is soil moisture that we measured in the plots um, going from the soil surface all the way down to over three feet into the ground um, here on the, the x-axis. And then on the y-axis here is the average soil moisture. And so there's only three on here. We're missing the um, we're missing the the grazed covered crop because that came in later on some of these. Um, so we didn't get good moisture measurements on that. But the thing that we found here is that one, this blue line, which always runs lower until you get to the deeper depths or greater depths, um, is that our ungrazed cover crop generally has less moisture. And you can see this green line, which is our swath grazing crops, compared to the control for most of the, the important part of the, the, the soil profile um, is running below you know, the control. And so why might that be? Um, mostly it is, or we think it's because the growing season is a little different, um, for those, especially in the cover crop where we let that grow throughout the, throughout the year, um, excuse me, throughout the fall. And so this grows into the, well into the fall. Um, and I didn't mention this, but this is actually the, this is the soil moisture in the wheat following these treatments. So this is not while the cows are out there or while the hay is out there. This is during the, the wheat growth phase. And so, um, the, you know, the take home message here is that the control has, the hay control generally has more soil moisture than the others. Um, and yet we still had that five bushel decrease. So it's probably not a moisture limitation um, on these others, which I kind of thought might be the case. Um, but that we didn't see any any moisture differences that would help explain why the grazing treatments had higher yields. So now let's look at a few other. This is a soil health talk. So let's look at some of the, the soil health um, indicators. So this is pre-plant carbon and organic matter following grazing, uh, which means that when we were going to plant our spring wheat, in the following year, we took pre-plant soil tests. And uh, these two graphs are looking at total soil carbon and then average organic matter. So these are more or less the same thing. They're just, uh, uh, total carbon is just a portion of average organic matter. But we have our, two, our three years of the study, 2021, 2022, and 2023. And I, I wouldn't, you know, the colors show the different treatments, but really what you see is that there's no real differences here. There are some, you know, year, yearly fluctuations, um, but there is no trend. You know, more or less, none of this is, is significant. None of this really changes all that much. And you wouldn't expect it to. Organic matter, as I said earlier, you know, that's something that's built over time. And you wouldn't expect to see any big shifts from a single single season. And so uh, just to show it though, that we don't really measure any differences here. Um, one that surprised me, this is phosphorus and nitrogen. So this is total phosphorus and total nitrogen. And so again, this is just a, uh, this is a, a, the, the, 
The phosphorus and the nitrogen that the plants take up is just a tiny percent of, of the this. Oh, this is organic plus inorganic. Um, but again, we don't see really any big differences. Um, you know, like fluctuations from year to year, and you'll see that. And this is one of the things that makes a lot of these indicators really difficult is you see that there's these lots of noise within the data, you know, so where is the signal? And we don't really see anything here. There is no trends um, in phosphorus. Some years it's greater. In fact, on, on the whole, probably the cover crop control for average soil phosphorus had the most if you averaged all these out. Um, but you would see that it doesn't happen every single year. Um, whereas we thought, yeah, you might see some phosphorus differences um, in the in the manure plots where there's lots of manure, but we didn't we didn't pick that up. And then this is kind of this is the one thing that really we really did see some interesting changes in. And you know, it's it's not super exciting science, but it, it really, I think it also is, is exciting to see that there is something that we can find that, that explains this. And as you probably guessed, you know, soil nitrate here um, is what seems to be driving this, this change. So you have on your y-axis, you have pounds per acre of soil nitrate. We have our treatment, swath graze, cover crop, you know, our control and cover crop control. And then I broke this out into the soil depths, whoops. And so these are in inches. So this is the zero to three inch, three to six inch, six to 12 inch, and then 12 to 24 inch. The red line here across, it represents the group average. And so it kind of is a little thick, I think lose some of the detail in the data. But the point here is you see this kind of stair step where it's significantly higher in the swath grays and then it decreases uh, to the control, this the hay control. And that's where we see quite a bit, almost a doubling of, of soil nitrate in the top three inches. And it still hangs on in the three to six where you know roughly um, similar in the cover crop grays and the swath grays, but then much less in the, in the uh, the control and the cover crop control. And so then below six inches though, um, it's pretty much the same. And so really what we're thinking about is just that very top layer of soil, um, which makes sense. You know, that's that's probably where 60, 70% of the root growth happens um, is in that, that top layer in many cases. And so that's where a lot of that is being concentrated. And you definitely see that more so in wet years where you have a lot more of that mineralization and you have a little bit more of that, um, you, you see some more of that stratification uh, in our climate. So take home here, lots more nitrate in the when we add cows. Ammonium, um, this is the other form that plants can use of uh, nitrogen and no differences in this one because typically, Ammonium doesn't stick around, it's very transient. And so most of it's being converted to nitrate anyway. Um, there is still, you can see there's a, there's some, you know, a fair bit in there, um, but there are no differences. And so really it's that nitrate fraction, um, which seems to be building up and which seems to be, um, seems to be benefiting the the wheat in those, in those plots. So, as a little bit further evidence, we looked at the flag leaf tissue in. Flag leaf uh, can be, sometimes, it's a good indicator of the nitrogen content, of the, of the nitrogen status of your plant. Um, and it gives you a sense for how well, you, how good your, your fertility is. And so this is the flag leaf end, which again, that's that big, the, you know, that fat leaf right below the, the head of the, of the wheat um, plant is how this is the, the X axis is your flag leaf content. And that's as a percentage. And then this is, it's regressed on the yield. So basically what you can see is the, the higher the flag leaf content of uh, nitrogen, um, the higher the yield. And so somewhere around, you know, 4% or so, we're starting to get towards, towards maximum 
yields. Um, this can be kind of a finicky one uh, because we, you get some weird numbers here too. So when you look at this, you know, we have this nice, go back here, you have this nice regression line, um, but when I break it out by treatment, you can see that it's a little bit more messy. Um, these are the same things, yield on the y-axis and then the flag leaf content in the in the x-axis, but now it's looking at by treatment. And so you can see this, they still, you know, the line, you can fit a pretty nice line here. And then for whatever reason, swath grays just didn't, it didn't respond. Um, and so that that measure is is useful, uh, but it's it's um, it's messy as well. So there's there's a lot of noise involved there. So now I'll just throw out a few more microbial indicators. Um, these when I put this together, I only had the two years of data, 2022 and 2023. Um, but it didn't change much from from earlier data. So this is average CO two. So what is this measuring? This was this is respiration, um, which is a proxy for microbial growth and activity. So basically, the higher the the CO two respiration, um, the more the more microbial uh, microbial activity we have. That's that's the assumption. Um, Kind of the same note. Yeah, you see this drop off here in the control, uh, but when you average it out again, you know, not not big changes. We do see a little bit more in the swath grays, but it's it's modest. Um, pox carbon. So that is one that's uh, very trendy in in soil health uh, tests. Pox carbon is is a carbon fraction that is expected to be available to to microbes that's this you know that's the the glucose the sugar that that is available to the to the microbes and uh, for quick turnover and so the theory is more more carbon the more of this pox carbon the healthier your soil because you have this greater microbial population and uh we do see a, a bump there uh in the swath grace again swath grace here Pox carbon content on the y-axis, and this is again zero to three and three to six inches. So you can see there's this huge stratification here, um, where it drops off quite. Oh, just in general, it drops off quite significantly, even just three inches below the soil surface. Um, but you know, and then it averages out too. We don't see many differences, even though there are some slight trends. Um, overall, swath grazing has a bit more pox C. Um, but it's not really significant again. This is looking at fungi and bacteria. Um, we don't see many, <laughs> I keep saying, I sound like a broken record. Not many big shifts. Uh, and I guess that's, you know, that's to be expected in some sense. I didn't mention this. This is all no-till wheat. So we, we do no tillage on here. Um, so when I think about fungi, that's probably a big uh, issue. You would see some, probably some changes there if we were tilling. Um, but even in both, you know, always we see this drop off in the zero or the three to six inch uh, soil layer, but no real differences here. No differences in the total bacteria. Um, and then our, our muscular mycorrhiza, so that's sometimes we shorten it to AMF. Um, we like to see AMF because they're they're great. They have these great mycelial networks that um, explore the the soil profile. Um, they're able to make specialized enzymes <clears throat> that can break some complicated phosph phosphorus bonds and make phosphorus available to the plants. Um, so they're very cool little creatures. But uh, in this case, we didn't really see any differences from the cows, which we thought maybe maybe we would see these. And then the fungi to bacteria ratio, sometimes that's used as a soil health measure as, um, you know, in that, you know, that third point three to point four is kind of a point three, which would be um, point three fungi to, to one bacteria uh, cell, I guess. Um, that's an interesting soil health indicator in that you can, can kind of monitor shifts in your fungi to bacteria ratio within the soil to, to predict 
um, the health of it being that, well, if you have this big shift in bacteria, for example, um, they're performing in many cases, specialized functions. And so uh, perhaps if your fungi are de decreasing overall, you might um, hypothesize that you have less carbon sequestration or less uh, degradation of some of those more complex um, carbon chains that are thought to only be able to be broken down by certain fungi. Um, whereas the bacteria are much, you know, much quicker turnover they're the ones that are doing a lot of that short-term uh, mineralization. And so monitoring those, those ratios is, is can be useful, um, but it also can be hard to kind of pin those down to specific functions. At any rate, um, we didn't really see any differences in those. And so um, getting to conclusions here, you know, as I kind of have said already a couple of times, building carbon and soil health is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, but one of the things that I, I am happy with this research that we wanted to show is there are some short term gains. And so we can maybe get a little bit of, uh, you know, we can we can eat our cake and, uh, and, and have it also. And, and so um, I think there there obviously there are trade offs in how you get the livestock into these systems. But there are some short-term benefits that can be gained. And so um, I think there's a lot of debate that can be had about how you do that, how you rotate paddocks, how you move them in and out, um, how you do this at scale. You know, we're looking at three acres, which is much simpler than a hundred acre, you know, or, or, or a quarter section or something. Um, and so how you do that, uh, Grazing standing cover crop versus swath. I'd love to get people's thoughts on this because um, there are pros and cons to both. Um, you know, obviously when you swath it, you have control over when it dies. And so that's important when you're grazing livestock, you can control the quality of it a little bit more closely. Um, and, and you can monitor or you can take it down or put it down when based on weather conditions and various other things. Grazing standing cover crop also has its benefits. The nice thing I think to me is that it's one less pass you have to make with a swather. Um, and so certainly some, some benefits there as well. The intensity is, you know, it's all over the board. We, we graze these pretty intensely. Um, this picture on the right shows, um, this is after a swath graze. And I'm sure some people would look at that and say, wow, that's not a lot left behind. Um, and there isn't a lot when you swath it, you know, that's, they, they take it, take it down to the, to fairly bare soil. Um, whereas on the left side here, you see the cow turning into the st grazing standing cover crop and they trample a lot more. They, they leave a lot more behind. And so there's different efficiencies there. Um, the short term carbon, you know, we didn't really see any, any big changes, perhaps a little bit in some of that, that quick turnover carbon. Um, but we're not going to see that, you know, this needs to, to be something that's regular and, and it's maintained over longer periods, um, to really start to, you know, build soil carbon. And then where we're going next year, we'll probably hopefully be doing more virtual fencing where we can move the, the herd a bit more strategically and move them. Uh, to areas where we want them to be and to, to hit pretty significantly, especially what we're thinking about where we have weed patches and things um, where we're reducing some of our other inputs like herbicides. Um, can we can we strategically graze areas that are maybe have higher weed infestation, things like that? Um, Anthony, I have a couple more slides uh, from other other research. But if there are questions, this might be a good place to stop and and discuss any questions. If there are no questions, I can I can go on to some move on or pivot to some other studies. Curiosity question: As you did you did you measure forage quality in any of the cover crops that you grew in this study? We did, um, and we have all those data. Um, and I don't, I haven't done much with the data. We, we, we definitely have all the quality values and compared it to the sorghum sedan. Um, 
but I don't have a lot right now to, to add to that. I think um, certainly it was a bit more uh, nutritious than, than the sorghum sedan alone. Um, especially if I remember correctly with the, the crude protein. Um, but we, I, I didn't, I haven't really, I haven't really uh, crunched the numbers on those. Chris, we do but, have a question here. Sure. Um, it's about your watering location. Was it static or did you move it around to encourage more uniform grazing over the entire paddock? Yeah. So that's a really good question. And, and one thing I would love to, I, <laughs> I saw the, this talk recently of these robotic water tanks. Um, so what we did though, it, no, the answer, the short answer is no. What basically what we did, I showed those, we had these long um, rectangular plots that were basically, they were three acres total, um, but they ran about a thousand, a little over a thousand feet. And so often what we would do is we'd have the water tank at the back, uh, at the end of one side um, and then we tried to fence off an area, um, of the, of that particular paddock. And so we did, we fence off in about thirds cause we were trying to move, uh, get through that three acres in three days. And so we'd fence off for the, the bottom third. Uh, and then we just open that up for the, then they'd have the two thirds for the next. And then they have the, the entire length. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because they always had to come back for the water, um, and of course, you know, then they, they tend to just lay down and, and, and sit, sit around the water. Um, but generally they did a pretty good job. They get hungry and then they move down where there's that nice fresh grass. Um, so I felt like even though the water wasn't moving, um, it was never very far, you know, only a thousand feet at the most. Um, and so they, they move quite a bit and they, they did, we did get pretty, pretty uniform coverage. This picture on the right, you can kind of see all these little piles. That's all manure piles. And so you can you can see there's a pretty good distribution. Um, from a soil science perspective, that's kind of a nightmare to try to sample because you get all these little islands. Um, and that reminds me, so our initially what we had was a bale graze, um, which we dropped after the first year and went to just a standing cover crop because the bale graze uh, it's not that I don't like the idea. Um, it's just that measuring soil responses in that is is truly a nightmare because it's it it, it literally is just these little little uh, islands of fertility, and then there wasn't much in between them. Got a couple more questions, Chris. Yeah, um, I can go and ask this. What this one's kind of a long question, but. What sort of crop blends get the best uptake by livestock and how do you compare the different biomass of different crops and compare for nutrient and livestock gain versus carbon and CO2? Uh, okay, so um, I can try to unpack that a little bit. One of the, the down or the, the shortcomings of this research is that the plots were too small to measure weight gain by cows, which I would have loved to have done. Um, but we needed, you know, and I'm not, I'm a, I'm a plant person. So um, take it with a grain of salt, but we needed much bigger paddocks for, to measure uh, livestock weight gain, just because you have a lot of these short-term variability and they need more time to graze. So unfortunately just our, our, our space limitations didn't allow for that. Um, but you know, in terms of cover crop mixes, I really do, like I said, I favor the grasses because what we're looking at is, is biomass production. Um, and even there, you saw in that short window, um, we're still getting just a ton to the, to the acre. And, and so um, I don't think you're going to get that with the broad leaves. Now, obviously with, the, with, we had the peas in there and we had a few other broad leaves, and so you add a little bit more quality, which I, I like even just that oat, oat pea, which is, is one of the oldest mixtures that we have um, going way back to before cover crops were a thing. Um, you know, I think it's still a pretty great mix. It does a lot of, it checks a lot of boxes and it's simple um, and it's relatively cheap. And so that, you know, that's my, my general 
I, I favor those things. I favor the cool seasons more than the warm seasons, just because our climate and our growing season seems to support those a little bit better. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, I, I don't have a lot to add on that. I wish I had more livestock data. And so that's one thing we're doing uh, more out at our cottonwood station uh, is hoping to graze a bit more uh, with cover crops and experiment a bit more with some mixes and where we find some of those those trends. Yeah, I think that's a research need that we need to do to see how much cows actually gain by grazing cover crops. Yep. So, and there's this guy has another question. Are you going to include methane testing in future trials to build information on background methane compared to methane and cover crops and then cover crops managed by livestock just to get some clear data how much methane is really being produced under managed livestock systems? Yeah, that's a really great question. And so um, we recently received a fairly large uh fund funding source that that's going to allow us to do a lot of that. So um, what we're looking at is grazing cover crops and, and measuring emissions, both from the livestock uh, through these green feed systems and then in the soil itself. Um, and so we're pretty excited about that. We're just at the start of that, but yeah, so there's this whole other, you know, emissions portion that I didn't even cover. Um, and so we're, we're looking at, we will be looking at what are some of the impacts of these, you know, there, there's some great work in North Dakota that showed um, it's hard. It's, you know, especially when you have, you have both methane and you have nitrous oxide um, emissions to balance. Um, do we get, you know, especially when you look at these bare fields, are we getting different emission scenarios from when you look in the background there, you can see this cover crop growing. Um, what are our emissions over the winter? Uh, so we're monitoring that throughout the, as a, a full twelve month scale and fairly high intensity. What are the what are the cows doing? Can we make these these? Can we? That's a weird way to say it. Can we can we manipulate the livestock in such a way that we can reduce their emissions? Um, is certainly a, a question that we're trying to answer with with many of these same grazing strategies. Don't have the data yet, but it will be coming soon, I hope. Okay, there's two more questions. Did you ever consider removing livestock earlier in the season and allow for some cover crop regrowth before freeze as a way to evaluate such things as catching winter snow slash extra moisture, for example? Yeah, that was a re that's a really good question, too. We, we debated that a lot. Um, so one thing we found, you know, one of the differences between if you have an oats and a sedan mix, and if you swath it, the sedan will come back, the oats won't come back. Um, so you can kind of manipulate that based on your your mixes. Now, the, the sedan will come back as long as your fall will allow it. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, depending on when you cut it. Um, but there are ways that you could manipulate manipulate that. And so we saw that to some extent with some of our sedan. Um, and I think that's, if, if you do that with the, the swath, that may be a nice, that may be a nice complement to that. You can see that bare field, you know, so if we cut it earlier, um, maybe we forego a little bit of biomass in the swath itself, uh, but we promote some, some fall growth to, to retain some of that snow catch as you implied. Um, the issue is, are we going to get that that August rainfall for us? I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't place a lot of money on it. Um, and even the September is a little bit variable. But at the same time, we've been having you know our first frost in many cases is is much later. We've been having great falls, so we've been. It's we see growth all the way into November in many cases. Um, so it's a trade off. If I was East River, I think that's a much better proposition. Um, you might get a lot more growth given the probability for higher rainfall in that in that fall period. Um, so certainly one way that in that swath in particular where you could you could potentially mix up your 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 species composition to promote some of that later fall growth. Um, there's a question in the Q and A as well. Uh, the question is when were the livestock introduced each year? The time of year did you do the grazing? 
Yeah, so that would have been in the fall. So it kind of varied depending on like 2021 was very dry. So they came off pretty early because there wasn't much left. So that was like late August that year. The other two years um, where we had better, better growth, they were able to stay out on the summer pastures longer. And they came on in September. Um, and that was, that was kind of a function of, it was just the way that the schedule worked out for us. Initially, what I would have loved is um, I saw this as how can we extend the growing season? Well, uh, we did extend the growing season to some extent here, but I would want to continue to push this. And so we can go later and later in the fall. Um, some of that is just logistics for us specifically. And some of our um, capabilities to, to manage the cows, if say, a, you know, a snowstorm came in, it was a little difficult. Um, but yeah, so the short answer is it was late August one year, and then it was September into October the other two years. So late, late September, early October kind of time frame. Okay, time, time is kind of rolling on here. Um, Chris, if you could unshare your presentation, John has a poll to put up, and okay. then uh, we can keep keep doing the questions. Um, those of you, we'd like to have you take that poll, uh, if possible, helps us to do future planning. Um, is there any more questions, Hans? Here it is. We keep hearing that cows are villains in greenhouse gas emissions, so some scientific research that has verified data would be huge. Looking forward to seeing some data in the future. I think that's just a statement, though. Um, and if you have any comments, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, the, the basic idea is that methane and nitrous oxide have this much greater capacity to, to trap heat um, than CO2. And so the culprits for that are, well, methane in particular is livestock. And um, I, I agree, though, that's, that's one of the things that uh, the reason why we, we went after this funding is to really see on a full life cycle basis what are those emissions? What are the impacts? What are the practices that we can make them a little bit more emissions friendly? Um, and so totally agree. Um, you know, and, and I think there is a lot of room for innovation here and that's kind of what we're looking for and where we're moving forward on. Oh, great. Great. Thanks, Chris. I shared the CCA uh, barcode there. Please uh, scan that for your credits. Um, there is one more question. Could there be a possibility of grazing before the winter wheat could be planted? Say if too wet to plant spring wheat and plant cover crop instead. So uh, prevent plant spring wheat goes to cover crop and then you plant winter wheat following that. Um, yeah. So it's too wet to plant the spring wheat Let's plant a cover crop ahead of the uh, winter wheat seeding that would take place. Mm -hmm. I think that's how I would interpret that. Yeah, and the, the it could. I uh, the, the proposition again is how much moisture is going to be available to plant that winter wheat into um, in the fall. You know, certainly we take we we have a we stack our wheat a lot of times where. We'll go wheat, wheat, and then we'll we'll rotate out of it at our farm. And so in that case, we're harvesting wheat in July, and then we're planting wheat in September, you know, latest the first week of October. Um, so I think there's certainly an option to, or a possibility to do that, but it's, you know, it's depends on when you, you get those cows in and when you graze. Again, I think the swath might be a valuable piece there because you can control that. You can take it down if the cows aren't ready to move from say a summer pasture or from wherever they are. Um, that would give you some flexibility uh, if you're feeling feeling confident with, with the rainfall there. Okay, there's another question. I think you already, we already answered this question though. Was there any evaluation of cattle weight gain versus traditional whole season pasture slash rangeland grazing? Yeah, and, and it, unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. Our pastures is, or our our plot sizes were just not not big enough to to get reliable numbers on that. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks everyone for for sitting in.
and uh, be happy to, if, uh, uh, if any others want to follow up with me, you can find my email um, to chat further. Thank you for attending today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and, and on Thursday as well. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris.